please pause the video and take a moment to read this important safety message. Hey, welcome back everyone. Part two here in this David Haffler uh, DH220 series. Uh, as you saw in video one, we've decided to take a deep dive on this restoration. So as I opened up the parts kit from eBay that I ordered, um, there was a thumb drive inside. And this is when I inserted the thumb drive, this is what's in there. And this first folder, it has some nice color pictures here, as you can see, um, that might help you with um, how the installation would go and whatnot. But then when you come over here to the uh, D DH220 folder, well, there's a couple different things in here. And one of the first things is um, some assembly instructions that are, I think these were the original ones written by the, uh, by the person selling these. And it, it kind of walks you through, hey, you do all these installs, da da da. Um, you put it all together and then it gets you down to chassis wiring and how to connect all that up. And then it kind of, you know, how long the wires should be and whatnot. And then it gets into the bias and offset. But it's a pretty word heavy, you know, uh, guide to this of whatnot. And apparently one of the people that bought this kit then turned around and made this set of instructions um, that the, uh, the seller now includes. And this is a pretty, uh, what I would call a pro set of instructions here, right? Well laid out. A chassis parts list, whatnot. Uh, goes through a little bit of how to solder. Then it uh, kind of walks you through, hey, we're going to put these resistors and here's where, where we're going to put them. And by the way, they even break down the color coding for you on these resistors. So you don't have to look each and every one of these up. And most of these are, if you can see, are pretty high precision. So they're, uh, they're not four band, they're five band resistor color codes. So um, that'll help in that scenario. And you can see here, it kind of walks you through all the different resistor installs. Uh, then it talks a little bit here about when you get to the power resistors and the flame proof, how you need to stand those off from the, uh, from the board a little bit. Similarly here with the power resistors and how to stand those off. Then it gets into your semicol you know, semiconductors, your, uh, your 1N4148 diodes here, small signal diodes. Um, then it gets into how to install the potentiometers, some zeners that are involved in this in this unit, and so on and so forth. It kind of takes you through all the way through it, installing uh, various capacitors uh, and, and whatnot, uh, heat sinks on things. But it, it is a I, I would call this a pro set of instructions. And honestly, this is part of why I bought this kit. Um, the, the people talked about how good the instructions were. Shows you, you know, everything you need to know here about how to mount everything up in nice pictures. And if this doesn't get it, remember in that other folder, you got some nice color coded pictures. So let's spin around and uh, start start building these boards. Looks like complete. Inside you got the board, you got a parts kit that says one, two, three, and four, and that's kind of the order you go in, right? And then there's also a bag here that has the, uh, the ends and wires and whatnot. We'll save that part for last, I believe. We're just gonna, what I would call stuff the boards. Now, I thought about doing both boards in parallel with each other, you know, all these resistors, all these resistors. But then I got thought I got too much of a chance to cross pollinate parts and maybe get, you know, uh, just get confused or mixed up because I got too many parts on the table going for too many things. So I just decided to build one and then the other. Okay, I'm getting slightly old, so uh, <laughs> I use a magnifying glass, got this, just this little brass uh, kind of stand mounted. I put all my resistors together, together tightly like this, so I can just hover the, uh, the unit over. And I was looking for a uh, brown, green, black, brown, brown. I've got these little uh, devices here designed specifically for bending you know, the leads of components like this. So you kind of put it in the middle here like this, um, here at the 10, and then you, you take it and you bend them over like this. And what you end up with on the other side is a, you know, kind of a perfectly bent um, resistor. Okay, I'm also using a little stand here to hold the, uh, the board off. And uh, this is just some solder I've had a long time, but it's a uh, 6337, uh, uh, tin lead and uh, just heat these up just enough to there we go to kind of you know make sure it flows good onto the but the lead and the uh, the trace on the board and then once you got that done then you just use a pair of uh, you know flush mount cutters here 
and you trim off the top. One thing I found interesting, if you'll notice here, there are some black single stripe resistors, which are zero ohm resistors, which is basically the, essentially the same as, you know, just a, uh, you know, a straight wire, right? Zero ohms. So you may wonder, well, why would they have zero ohm resistors in here instead of just straight wires? Um, or why not? With, why wouldn't they have done that with circuit traces? Well, what these really are are kind of jumpers um, to get you from one part of the board to another. Because one of the goals, of it, if you read the documentation that came with it, it talks about one of the goals here was to never cross signal paths anywhere in this board. So. You wouldn't want to have your signal coming around, going from one device to another and crossing over, you know, a path. So, um, um, in any way, shape, or form. So that's what they're doing this for, just in case you were wondering. Okay, we've gotten all the resistors done on this side. Took about 45 minutes, maybe a little bit longer to do all these and do them properly. Now we're on to bag two, and it'll tell you to pay close attention to the lead spacing. So most all of these were the exact same width. In other words, I used the same little fold here. Um, but this it'll tell you to pay attention that the lead spacing is much wider on some of these, as well as they need to be held off of the board. So, Okay, up next is the inductor. And inside of it goes this resistor, this 2 watt resistor. So what I ended up doing was um, kind of stuck the resistor inside of the inductor, folded the leads over, and then um, st stuck the induct stuck the resistor down through there, and then kind of guided the inductor. And it does say in the instructions to make sure you solder these really good so it soaks through the other side. This is a high current point, but you kind of get the idea there. And then I kind of floated the resistor in the middle of this inductor from a heat standpoint it's not and that wraps it up for the resistor section um, we're now moving on to the semiconductors and then it has us do the potentiometers on in with the uh, semiconductors we follow the instructions okay up next are these 1n4148 there's five of them and um, the instructions will walk us through exactly where to put them and they will have a single stripe on one end of them. That's the cathode end. And the little markings here, like D1, it'll show a stripe on one end. You just match that little black stripe up with the stripe on the board here and insert and solder. Okay, up next, uh, the two potentiometers. It says take the, uh, the turn dial here. It's only on one side and face it towards C1. We'll go right here and face that direction. And then P2 will end up going um, right here and facing somewhere. I'm going to have to straighten the leads out on this one, but you get the idea. And we got both of those potentiometers in. Now there's four zeners. There are 4743As. And um, the same thing. you got a stripe on one end, which is the cathode, and then you'll in here. They're denoted Z1 through Z4 instead of D1 through D5 like the diodes were. Okay, up next you're going to have a little bag, and this one's labeled 10.4, and in it's a pair of JFETs, and what it is is these are matched, okay? So, um, and then that's the 10.4. So we're going to, and these are 2SK 170 BL JFETs, and we need to uh, shape the leads a little bit. So you're going to want to kind of bend them about a quarter inch up off the, the unit. You're going to want to have them come out a little bit and then turn. Same over here, kind of come out and turn. So when you're done, you kind of got this, uh, you know, three evenly spaced. And then it will, these will end up going into Q3, Q4 here. So let's find those. And um, I think that'll be the flat side. So... You just want to make sure you've got them spaced enough apart that, that ultimately you can end up dropping these down. Oh, and I'm seeing how they've got the board labeled now. So um, in this little box here, um, you've actually got an S down here on this end for the source. And if you've got the flat side, the lead on the right will be the source. So it's, it's kind of backwards. The flat doesn't go towards the uh, side here with the, uh, the holes mark going back and forth. 
So you'll end up with the uh, flat side actually away from that. And uh, we'll get them like that. It is important when you're soldering these to either solder them very quickly or you can put an alligator clip on this side to dissipate some of, oops, to dissipate some of the heat so that this uh, chip doesn't get too hot when soldering. All right, we've got all the transistors in at this point in time now. And you can see here, up next is Q10 and Q11. And these are a different style container here. And what we're going to do, these are the T05 style container. And they come with a little spacer here. And this spacer is designed, you can kind of see it's a three, three pronged half moon shaped circle there. These spacers go on the transistor on the bottom to keep the metal can from touching anything else on the board or whatnot. And then you can see there's a little tab on the edge of this um, circle. There's also a little tab on the transistor here. Um, you will just drop it down in there just like that. Um, you can bend these leads out just a little bit. They do recommend clip an alligator lead on the end of each of these you're soldering to help suck away some of the heat to keep it from uh, overheating the the transistor. So we are done soldering this unit. Now I can snip the leads off and put the next one in. Okay, we're now done with all the transistors onward to capacitors at this point. So as you can see, I've opened the bag here and um, what we've got in it, we've got some polypropylene caps. It looks like we have some Nikicon electrolytics here that are polarized. So we'll have to, uh, maybe this one's not polarized. Interesting. Um, and that one definitely, as you can see, the stripes there. Yeah, these polypropylene caps, any of these brown ones, uh, they're, they're not polarized. So it doesn't matter whether you put them in, you know, one way or the other here. Um, but these couple of these electrolytics will matter. The same as these ceramic disc capacitors here, the little blue ones, uh, they're not polarized as well. And up next is this, uh, goes right here C6 and you'll notice it's labeled bipolar and on here it's 100 microfarad BP so bipolar um, it's a high value capacitor electrolytics you know to get them high value typically end up being polarized but there are certain circumstances you can't use a capacitor in a, that's polarized and so they do make these bipolars they're a little expensive though Okay, C12 is your typical capacitor, uh, electrolytic. You know, you got a shorter lead here, and you got the white markings on one side to indicate the positive. Then down on the board, it's got a—I mean, uh, to indicate the negative. Then down on the board, you've got a positive lead, little mark right here. So it's super easy to get these right and just uh, get them up in there, all the way up against the board. Kind of push out the leads like that on the other side, and then uh, solder it up. Okay, all the components are on the board, and now all I've got to do is install these two wing-style heat sinks that just push down onto these T05, and I'm going to put a little heat sink grease on them. You don't have to, and it didn't say to in the instructions, but, um, you know, anytime you can close the gap a little bit on a, uh, you know, on a transistor with just a tad bit of heat sink grease between it and the, uh, and I'll take the excess off the top here, and, uh, wipe it all away and then we'll just push this unit down and it says be very careful make sure you don't have the wings hit anything else but that'll do it just like that and uh now it's and this stuff is like it's it goes everywhere <laughs> so as you can see there it is the finalized board what i will do now is just build the other board the good news is it'll be much simpler and the reason why anytime you've done one you know, the next time around, you have a reference here. So one thing I always do before I jump down a path like that is I'll double check everything on here. It's worth the 10 minutes to just make sure all the diodes are pointing in the right direction, that your electrolytic capacitors are pointing in the right direction, that, you know, you kind of got the right resistors and the right transistors pointed the right direction and whatnot. Because if you're going to duplicate something like this, you don't want to have something wrong here and then have it wrong on two different parts. So we'll spend our 10 minutes doing that and then we'll get busy building this one and uh, we'll see you back after that. 
One thing I thought I would try this time is I uh, changed out the tip on my soldering iron. So instead of the original tip that that came on the Heiko, you know, I've got it several different size tips, but this one's a little smaller one. Just to see on these little um, little solder pin holes here whether this would do any better. It do I'm not going to say it does a better job. It might be slightly easier. I see it's flowing through to the other side well. And so you might want to just pick up a spare tip. You can get them on Amazon or wherever, just uh, just in a slightly smaller size. Okay, we've soldered quite a few resistors in now with the smaller solder tip. And I'll tell you, it doesn't make it any easier. Uh, matter of fact, it might take it just a slight bit longer to heat it up. Um, but it does end up with a little bit neater result. And one other tip I thought I'd show you, if you don't have one of these little... Uh, lead bending devices. By the way, you can pick these in a three pack up cheap off of eBay. Just look for lead bending uh, tool, I think it is. But anyway, if you don't have that, another tip you can use, use a pair of needle nose pliers and get it down. You kind of put the component about where you want it in the in the width of the unit and then you can just take your fingers here on the needle nose pliers and bend it straight down on both sides and you can kind of end up with the same result. Not quite as nice because this has the recessed place for the component to drop down in it, but it will work. As I'm soldering the second one together and I've been debating um, you know, which is more effective, which do I like better, the the factory size uh, soldering tip that came on this or the a much finer one. and. Um, there are certain points where the finer one works really well on these on the resistors and whatnot, but then there's other components, um, you know, the larger components, some of the zeners or whatnot, where this just doesn't cut it, and you need this one. So if I had to stick with one for the whole thing, I think it would be this, and, uh, and if you're willing to swap out in the middle, then maybe use both, but you certainly would be fine using the uh, just the standard tip throughout the entire build is my conclusion. Okay, we've got both boards done at this point. Uh, double checked everything, triple checked everything. Um, I will say about an hour and a half per board. Um, and I consider myself a, a decent solderer. So maybe two hours for somebody new, a little more. But uh, about an hour and a half per board on these. Let's get into the amp because everything else, uh, as you can see here, goes inside of the uh, great big uh, chassis. Okay, we're back on the bench now. Got our instructions finally printed out, and um, I'm on page 18 at this point. Um, both the boards, as you guys had seen, are now complete. And so we're now we're going to be working through the chassis and the things we got to do here. And I love whoever wrote these instructions um, did a really good job because, you know, it'll walk you right through removing these screws, remove the top cover, unsolder these wires and it gives you a little check box to just kind of you know check off as you get them done and keep moving down the list so let's do that okay first thing it's telling me to do is unsolder the wires here at LF and RF and um, FL here and FR here and then it's telling me to reposition this is kind of a before diagram which is figure two and this is figure five which is kind of an after diagram telling me to turn the little um, tabs here. If you'll notice 180 degrees from where they're at right now and then we'll kind of proceed forward from there. So I'm going to go do that. For that I'm going to go ahead and take off these things because they're in the way of what I'm trying to do here per the, per the diagram. So pretty simple procedure here of uh, cut these things loose and uh, take that off and then they're they're out of there. All right, I'm supposed to be flipping these around and getting to the nuts, and I'm finding it's darn near impossible with these capacitors in place, and I know I'm swapping them out anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, break all these, uh, go ahead and take this capacitor out of the unit and, uh, and disconnect all the wires going to it. All right, in the sake of simplicity of changing out these jacks and various things, and I'm just reading ahead a little bit of the instructions, I went ahead and broke the rest of the wiring loose that connected the two two side pieces here. It's just, just a couple wires holding them on. And I'm going to be replacing all the wiring anyway, so it just makes things easier to get in here and work on at this point. But you could not do that and follow the instructions step by step um, and still get there. I'm just doing it for ease of... He's getting in here and working. 
Okay, get down to here, and then it says if you purchase the capacitor upgrade kit, do the next five steps, and it's basically having you remove the screws, which it's basically walking you right through what the things I just got done doing, removing the capacitors. And then it has you install the new capacitors and adjust the capacitors. Orientation is critical. Positive terminals must be on the right here when viewed um, from the front, and this being the front of the unit. As you can see, I've got the positive terminals on these capacitors here on the right side looking from the front. Now I'm just uh, going to lock these lock these capacitors back down with the, um, with the clamp mount they have on them here. And you don't want to tighten them too much. You don't want to squeeze or distort the caps. Just, just get them snug. And then we're going to put our uh, ground bus here back on the middle. And it will be going on the negative post on this side and the positive post over here on the other side so don't don't confuse that uh, there's a positive rail and a negative rail on these units so don't end up with this capacitor turned around and both of them going to, to uh, negative just because we're calling this a ground bus here in the middle but as you can see somebody made this out of some copper strap the original was a piece of wire you could use some like 10 or 14 gauge wire between some wires, lugs, uh, lots of different ways to go about this. I'm going to reuse what's there. Okay, up next then it says unscrew and remove LS and RS input jacks, the two RCA jacks, reclaim all hardware, remove LB or LR, RR and RB, so all these input jacks right here, and reclaim all hardware. Separate the original and right PC driver boards from the heat sinks by unscrewing the three screws, reclaim six screws and standoff. All right, let's let's get that done. Okay, so we got the RCA jacks out. We got this eyelet on the ground lug here, kind of cleaned out as it recommended. Next, it's telling us to um, take these boards and unsolder all the wires from these, and at the same time, take these screws off. We're basically going to be uh, removing these boards. I'm gonna use a FR300 Heiko desoldering gun to get out the solder out of all these holes but you can achieve the same thing with um without doing that it just makes the job a little easier here when you can when you remove all the solder and pull the wires out um you basically got a solder gun and a uh <laughs> a remover all in one here now since i am going to be replacing all my wires um took a different route I just cut them loose because I'm not going to be reusing these boards so um, what I'll do is I'll end up unsoldering these putting new wires in place because I'm gonna put some silver plated Teflon wiring throughout this amplifier um, otherwise I would have gone the route of like I showed you unsoldering all these okay once you get the boards removed from these then it's going to take you to this little set of um, instructions followed by figure three here which first thing it tells you here is removing existing capacitors between the chassis ground terminal and MOSFETs Q4 and 16 so that's these little capacitors here that it's talking about um, as well as these it's these green ones and these um, then it says do not remove the balancing capacitors between Q14 source and gate that's these little ones right here and right here um, and then it goes on to tell you uh, to salt what to solder in here so let's get these out okay so next we've soldered the two um, these are 0.1 microfarads labeled 104s between ground here on the center lug and to the let's see these go to the drain on each of these the top two it does say make sure you don't remove this balancing capacitor between the source and the gate right here so you leave it intact and up next what it's telling you to do then is solder a wire between b plus here and this b plus rail here that is going to the uh to the drains on these so uh, i'm using some silver coated teflon wire here and just going to leak it down to that Okay, I've got the B plus and the B minus here, and as you'll see, these will just end up folding over and fitting nicely. There'll be two holes here that you'll end up using mounting these uh, back instead of three as it originally was. Okay, then you have to solder wires here. Um, 
that come off of the, the source 8 and 9 here and those end up going right down here number 8 and number 9 on the board and up next I've replaced the wires here and you could use the factory wires I'm just cleaning it up a little bit you got to do the gate 1 and gate 2 so I've replaced these wires here and then there's a spot on the board here let's see if we can find them G1 and G1 right here Okay, we're going to push through G1s right here and G2s here hiding underneath Q9. Uh, so I have to get down in there. And then what it will tell you to do is use two screws in the holes marked Y and Y. And it will also tell you to use two standoff, little rubber standoffs that were originally right here used on the factory setup. Alright, uh, Y and Y right there. And as you can see, we now have these all soldered up and ready to mount back on the board we just have to do the other one okay we've got both boards mounted now back on their uh, heat sinks here all the wires here routed properly as it as mentioned in the uh, the diagrams and whatnot and we are ready now to move on to the next step so this kit came with the set of um, gold-plated jacks for the speaker terminals and for the RCA inputs. And honestly, I don't like the, the speaker jacks here any better than what's already in here. These have a nice set of banana jacks. Um, and maybe these weren't factory, I'm not sure. Maybe somebody replaced these at some point. But I'm going to save these for another project because I kind of like what's in here. But I am going to replace the the two RCA jacks here. They definitely were uh, those old cheap style that uh, just don't don't connectors don't go on too well and whatnot. If you wanted to replace those connectors, the instructions here will uh, let me get this clear. We'll walk you right through how to do this. It's it's nothing complicated. Now for the for these, I'm going to use um, you got you got to make sure you use the insulator on the outside and the inside here to keep it uh, isolated from the chassis. So we'll put one on one side and one on the other side. Then we'll put this little uh, solder tab for the outer part and then we'll put the two locking washers on our lock bolts here on it. Okay, I got these mounted and I don't know if you can see down in here very well or not, but a royal pain. I ended up going from one ground lug to the other ground lug, then down to this terminal. And I used a uh, piece of uh, 20 gauge copper wire here, but I got all three of those tied together so that uh, the chassis ground is good here. And next I'm going to use a multimeter here just to test. Let's do that again. Okay, so next I'm going to use a multimeter here just to make sure the grounds are grounded and grounded to the chassis real good. And that the center parts aren't touching the chassis in any way, shape, or form. And as you can see here, they're not. Up next, I'm going to replace the factory 35, uh, 25 amp bridge here with the 35 amp bridge that uh, that I bought as part of this kit. And I'm going to have to save this uh, 103 here, the point, I think it's a point zero, point zero 0.01 capacitor going across. Okay, up next we just pulled out the, uh, the 25 amp. There's one screw that comes up from the bottom here that holds it on. and. Uh, once we got it out, then we've got to put it back the same way. So it's easy. The two red leads from the power supply are AC, so it doesn't matter which side goes to what. And it'll tell you here on this little block, AC, AC, and then there's a minus and a plus, okay? And um, one of these will end up going out to one of these wires, and one of these will end up going out to one of these wires. And this one over here is the positive one, so that it, it actually goes like that. And this one will feed out on the positive side. Okay, we've got the block mounted back down. I misspoke earlier. The positive is over here. Um, if you notice on the schematic diagram, the little positive sign, ooh, a little positive sign that is right here on this. And then uh, the little 0 .01 will go across the uh, two AC lines here. As you can see, the red, red go here. And then the positive rail um, will feed down to this plus here and the negative foot rail will feed down to here. Okay, and we've got it all soldered up. The two reds, the uh, 0.01 capacitor crossed here, that's a one kilovolt capacitor. 
the negative tied into this post and the positive tied down to that post. That little puppy has been replaced. And we've now soldered the ground wires um, to the left black, uh, the right black, and then I tied one off to the center here of these jacks on this. Okay, up next, since I bought a new switch, I'm going to wire it in. Um, it'll just, this old one will pop out and it'll just replace it wire for wire. And they get, they even give you a new little uh, XY safety cap here to go on it. And I'm just going to drop it into the same spot. thought while I was wiring this up, I could take a moment and show you how these little thermal circuit breakers here work. There's one on each heat sink. What happens is, as the power comes off of this power switch, it basically comes over here and ties onto a lug, where it then feeds in through this circuit breaker here, goes out, goes all the way across to the other one, back out of it, back down in to then feed the power transformer. What happens is, if either one of these circuit breakers gets too hot, they open, and it basically disconnects and kills the power. Um, to your amplifier at that point in time and so uh, these things are just in series with each other basically and ultimately uh, like I said kill the power if, if the amplifier starts to overheat. As I'm wiring this back up according to the instructions here if you'll notice um, it has us moving the white wire that used to come right here on the original wiring diagram now we're going to move it down to this unused lug on the very end. You'll notice how this was completely unused. And what we're going to do is insert the thermistor in here. So basically it's feeding through that circuit breaker down here through the thermistor back in then here to the circuit. And I've already done that. I've moved the white wire here down on this end. And I'm just going to go from this point to this point with the uh, thermistor. And as you can see, we've got it wired in now. Got this thermistor here, I mean the uh, circuit breaker wired in. Now we're just down to a few wires that feed our power switch. Back on the switch, if you'll notice it has three different colored leads. A copper, a copper, and a brass colored. The two copper will switch the AC and the brass one will be for the light. So I'm going to put the light on the furthest end down here because if you'll notice the way this feeds and it's actually going to be turned around like this, right? Um, you will feed this last little one off of this. So if you notice coming off here you got a 1 meg, then you got a diode, and that's what's actually feeding. It's just giving it a little bit of DC down here. Rec I call it DC. It's really rectified AC on this last one. And then we're actually switching between this fuse point and the transformer here. Um, with these two, and we've got this 0 .005 capacitor that'll go across there. Okay, it may be a little bit hard to see, but I've got the transformer wired onto this one. I've got the wire coming off the fuse here to the middle. I've got this 0 .005 cap here in the middle. Now I've just got a tie between, uh, let's look here. We've got a tie between, and the very left one, we're coming down, we're coming over. Yeah, we're tying right here on the uh, cathode end of the diode here. So really what we've got left now is wiring up these boards to the inputs here and to the outputs coming from these. And so you want to orient these things the right way here. If you'll notice um, number six is here on this end. Number six is right here. Number two is down on that end. That's right. Same as over here number See, two's up on this end right here, and six is down on that end. If you get these backwards, then uh, then they're not oriented correctly. So just kind of use those numbers. And then it's just as simple as uh, the inputs here are going to feed into the two inputs over here, the positive and the negative. Um, similarly, going to feed down here to the positive and negative. And I'm going to use some uh, some wire that I have for that. I'm honestly, what was in this thing was really nice silver coated Teflon. I may go back to what was originally being used because I don't think this is what originally came in the unit. And um, we'll just get this wired up. Actually the kit came with a decent set of wires here and uh, I think I may just use those. So uh, the right one will feed over here because as you spin the amp around this is the right hand side and this is the left channel. And um, we'll just feed from this over here to the end just like that. 
As you can see, the red one here going to the center lug of this, the black going to ground, same here. Over here, the red going into the positive on the end, and the negative here going to the negative. Same over here, negative on the end, positive here. And th this one's long enough, the, the kit they supplied, that you can lay this over like that. This one gets super tight when you do that, and I wish I wish they included another inch or so of, uh, of wire there on that one, because I like the idea of being able to lay these down without having to worry about pulling tension on the wires. Okay, now it's just as simple as um, number two here over to number four on this uh, fuse on FL, and then number six here to number two down here. Um, the out will come down here and go through this fuse holder, through it, out through the LR, um, and then similarly, which is the uh, the left channel um, output and that's not grounded, and then you'll follow the basically exact same thing on the other side. All right, let me turn off my uh, my smoke absorbing fan here, and I believe we are done with the wiring. I used some of the same wire for all of the connections, including the grounds here, and then I used the ones that came with the kit. You could have used the ones that came with the kit, you'd have been just fine. I just happened to like working with the uh, PTFE wire, and uh, if you've never worked with a thermal stripper, it's a lot of fun, <laughs> if nothing else. But I think we've got it all wired up now. Let's, uh, let's see what's next on the instructions. Okay, it basically says inspect all your soldering joints, uh, make sure you don't have any wires touching, where the wires go through these, make sure you've not jumpered any solder joints over to other spots that they shouldn't be, things of that nature. Then it says carefully remount the two heatsink assemblies to the chassis, making sure not to pinch any wires. We're going to do that. All right, we've got it, uh, got the two sides mounted back on it, have not powered it up yet. One thing I have decided is I'm not going to put back on it the rack mount ears. Um, these, this was a kit that you could buy after the fact and mount on the front of this. And uh, it just takes up more space in the shop and I don't need the rack mount ears. Someone else may want them and I'll put them on eBay or something. But um, So with that said, uh, now I think it is time to adjust this. Let's follow the uh, procedures here for adjusting for bias and DC offset. It says make sure the two potentiometers on each PC board are adjusted in the middle or halfway position. And what they're talking about here, let's see if I can flip it up here and get a small screwdriver. Okay, we're talking about this, 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 and this. These four potentiometers right here. So I'm going to make sure they're all centered. Okay, we've got those centered. Then it goes on to say um, adjustments are necessary to match the MOSFET outputs in your amplifier with these driver boards, which we're going to do. The following instruments are required. An ammeter capable of resolving 250 millivolts DC. I've got a uh, Fluke 179 here we're going to use for that. Then it says here you're going to want a voltmeter capable of resolving 10 volts, and I've got a Fluke 87. By the way, what it's asking to do here, about any voltmeter on this earth will do, so so no worries about that. And then it says a uh, variac would be plus, but not required, and I have one, um, so we're going to use it. Okay, this is what it tells you to do. Remove all four fuses. That way this channel is not going to get turned on at all. And you're, what you're going to do is you're going to insert between FL1 and FL2 that 2 amp fuse that it gave you. And that's, to, that's so the fuse will blow before anything else does here. And then between these other two connections, FL3 and FL4, what we're going to do is we're going to connect two wires that feed down into our multimeter. And you got to move this over from the volt section over to the current and ammeter mode. And we're going to put it on ammeter over here. And then this will be what we're reading, what's flowing between where the other fuse would have been right there in FL3 and FL4. What it tells you to do then here is turn on the amplifier and adjust the line voltage to 120 volts AC. Use the supplied PC board pictorial, which is this picture right here, and adjust P2 for an ammeter reading of 250 milliamps. Then slowly adjust P1 for zero volts at the output terminals within plus or minus 10 volts. So we'll connect in here to the output terminals um, and parallel that with these speaker outputs I've got here. 
and adjust that. All right, we got it brought up slowly here to 120 volts on the Variac. Um, if you'll notice here, we've got minus 146.9 milliamps DC. Ignore the minus because if you just flip these around, there's really no, when you're measuring current, there's no positive or minus, negative here. Um, and what we're going to adjust is P2 here. It'll tell us in this. It says adjust P2 for a reading of 250 milliamps. And if you look at this picture, the when you turn it like this, the top one is P1, the bottom one is P2. So we've got to get in here and get down to the bottom one. We're going to want to adjust it here till we get to 250 milliamps right here. That's pretty spot on right there. And then if we look over here on the other side, this is our DC offset, and this will be P1. So as I turn it, you're just trying to get this to zero. You're wanting zero volts on your speaker leads. That's pretty close right there. <laughs> All right, this side is done. Okay, then what it has you do is you can either leave these two out, take the two amp out of this side so this channel's done, and what you do is you put the two amp fuse on the right hand side here, which is um, FR3 and FR4. And then on FR1 and 2 here on the left side, you connect up your, uh, your multimeter here. And we will bring it back up and see what we get. Similar story here. Notice 65 milliamp, 66 over here and over here on this side. Get it where you can read it. We've got minus 2 volts, so let's adjust uh, P2 first to get us to 250 millivolts, 70, and like I said, just ignore the minus sign. I could flip those leads around and that minus would go away. What we're setting is the idling current going through these transistors with no input signal. This one's bouncing around just a hair, but you get the idea. We're going to get it set here. Okay, we've got it bouncing around here at 250, and now we'll just adjust P1 until we got this at zero volts over here. Oh, I've got the I've got the uh, meters in the <laughs> still in the other one. Let's see what we get here. It's not good. All right, a few things have transpired since our last little segment. If you remember, I had about negative 40 some volts here on my output, which would have been going to my speakers, which by the way, this is why I've got this fed up into a dummy load and not into a speaker, because that would have been bad on a speaker cone to have negative 40 some volts DC on it, okay? But I knew then I had a problem somewhere here, okay? So what I did was I got my multimeter out and I took a bunch of voltage readings. I measured the B minus voltage right here. I measured the B plus voltage right here. I me measured the voltage here at this ground point. I measured the voltage where the wires fed from G1 and G2. And a few other key things. I measured the voltage here on the positive rail, on the negative rail here, so on and so forth. I bundled all that up and I sent it off to the guy I bought these kits from to say, hey, something's not right here. You got any tips for me? And I gave him all these voltages. And he gave me a few pointers that ultimately led me towards um, helping find the problem. But what really helped me find the problem was I stepped away for a day, got my head clear, came back early one morning, started looking at it. And I, what I did was I, I started comparing this board again to this board intensely. Come to find out, if you remember the circles I drew earlier in the video, um, I had these two Q4 and Q5, um, Q, excuse me, Q5 and Q6 pointing this direction. They're supposed to be pointing that direction. This side was right, this side was wrong. Okay, so we, I pulled those out. I assumed they were fried. I tested them with a, uh, I just use a little uh, Atlas DCA uh, transistor tester here. So I tested them and lo and behold, they were good. So I put them back in, turned them around. Everything's fine now. <laughs> In the meantime, then, I go and wire this back up like we're supposed to in the diagram to turn everything back on, and something still wasn't working, and I'm pulling my hair out, and I'm, I'm digging, and I'm digging, and I'm digging. Come to find out, when you first turn this unit on, I know it says here to have a unit rated for 250 milliamps. 
This one's even rated for 400 milliamps. It popped the fuse inside my flute multimeter here on the 400 milliamp side of things. So, got another fuse on order for that. That's why I'm using <laughs> this. I called this um, Dusty Trusty. It, it, it has never failed me. I've had it for decades. It's a Fluke 8060A, but it, it sits over here and gets so much dust on it that the next time I need it, it's so dusty, I call it old Dusty Trusty. But at any rate, um, so be careful. This one has a 2000 milliamp or a two um, amp setting. Um, that's what I'm using it on, so I probably won't pop the fuse on that, but be careful. Even the guy that um, made these, he warned me about that in his email. Um, so at any rate, let's get it biased up now on the right hand side. Okay, I've got my Variac at 240, I mean, excuse me, 120, and I've got 244 over here. So we're going to adjust it and get as close as we can here. That's pretty close right there. Okay, now over here on the other side, you'll notice we're, we're on 0 0.001 volts DC, so I'm not even going to mess with the... Uh, with the DC offset and the 251, you don't have to be right on 251, 249. Um, you're just setting only the idle current here and get as close as you can. That's pretty close right there. All right, we're going to call it a wrap on that. This side is working well. Let's get this thing put back together. All right, a little bench testing here. Let's run a THD versus frequency sweep on this amplifier and see what we get out of it. The good news here, as you can see, the pink line and the blue line are tracking pretty much identically to each other. So I don't have a difference between one channel and the other channel. These things are tracking dead on. Um, next up, you know, it looks like, you know, we're starting out down here at 0.16% distortion, 0.15. Um, at the highest point here, we creak up to 0.237% distortion, which is still a, a super low number. Um, and then we, you know, we finish out down here around the 0.195% distortion. So, you know, all way below 1% distortion. Um, I don't remember what the factory specs are on these, but the good news is tracked fairly linearly. The frequency response wasn't, I mean, uh, the THD wasn't much higher or lower anywhere across the band. Let's switch over now and run a frequency response. Good news is, there again, the blue and the pink are tracking almost on top of each other, almost making this line look purple, which means left and right channel are, you know, doing the same thing together. This is an interesting, you know, it's it's not the flattest curve I've ever seen. What this tells me is this amplifier has a slightly more gain on the high end here, so it's likely to pay uh, trouble and uh, high end notes a little more than the bottom end. Now, at 100 hertz, this thing is sitting at 0 0.05 minus dB, point, minus 0 0.03 and point, minus 0 0.05 dB right along here. So it's it's pretty flat, you know, right here. You have to get down here to start dropping off any at all. You really have to get down here to uh, what would be 10 hertz uh, or 20 hertz, way, way down the spectrum. So really, if you're looking at it from a minus 3 dB standpoint, it never gets to minus 3 dB. So all this is within the bandwidth. We just have a little bit of uptick on the other end, but it's happening on both channels, which tells me it's a little bit inherent to the design of the, uh, probably the driver boards here. So nothing bad, um, and we'll, we'll see how it sounds. Okay, we've got the unit in place here, um, down in the barn, playing it through. Nice set of L100s, and uh, couldn't be happier with how it turned out. Thanks for watching this series. If you get a chance, watch the uh, series here on the uh, DH110 preamp as well. Thanks, everyone.